All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Nicole Owens. I am the Director of Marketing Communications for MassMedic. If you're not familiar with us, we are a medical device trade association that works to bolster the industry, primarily in New England, through education and events like this, um, connection, advocacy, and awareness. Today, we have a great webinar on the evolution of home health care and home health devices brought to you by our friends at Intertech. Um, we are going to have time for Q&A. So throughout the conversation, please feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll make sure um, that we do our best to get to them and get the answers to you. This webinar is also being recorded, so anyone who registered for it will receive a recording and will receive the slides after the webinar. All right, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Mike and Clarissa from Intertech. Take it away, guys. Yes, thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you to MassMedic for having us back. We are so very excited to be here to talk about one of our favorite topics, which is home health care devices and everything that we're seeing with the evolution of these types of products in the medical industry. Uh, my name is Clarissa Benfield, as Nicole mentioned, I am our global director and business line leader at Intertech for our medical and laboratory division. And today I'm joined by one of our subject matter experts, Mike Rousseau. Mike, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure, I'm uh, Mike Rousseau. I'm the regional chief for medical and lab, pretty much the same thing for her. I'm dealing with mostly North America and I guess the buck stops with me when it comes to technical. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So as I said, we're going to look at home health care devices today. Going to start out with some of the trends that we've been seeing as an assurance, testing, inspection, and certification organization. Obviously, we get involved at many different points in the development cycle with medical devices. And we're really excited to look at the trends that we're seeing with home health care type products, consumer products that are moving into the home health space. And then we'll transition into a little bit more technical, going through some of the requirements from a standards uh, standpoint when you're looking at testing for these types of devices. All right. So some of the things that we've seen over the past few years, trends that we've been seeing even pre-pandemic, but of course these have just been exacerbated even more with what we've seen with COVID and the pandemic. So we've seen, of course, aging populations and this increase in chronic illnesses. This is a trend that has been over the past few years with boomers getting older. And this will be something that we'll continue to see and have to take into consideration. And it's just one of the areas that is contributing to this growth that we're seeing with home health care and home health care devices. We've also seen an increase in health care costs. Another thing that the pandemic really shed a light on. Um, you know, going to get health care can be really expensive. And, you know, there's the idea of health equity and making health accessible for all people want their health care at their fingertips and the costs can be prohibitive. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in these types of devices in markets where it's either supported by the government or we're seeing insurance coverage for these types of devices. Uh, we've seen a lot of opportunity and development coming from those regions and those markets. The other thing I think, you know, Everyone who's listening, everyone who's on this call is a consumer, views themselves as a consumer. And now we see patients as consumers and they view themselves that way as well. Um, they want to have input and say into how their devices operate, how they're receiving healthcare. And it's really this idea of a push towards consumer driven healthcare and the patient as becoming, as becoming a consumer. And so that's something we've seen a lot of and will likely continue to see even more of as we see technology advancements, as we see, you know, new, new market entrants, and as we see, you know, just these incredible developments in the medical space and in medical technology. And then we're also seeing, you know, people wanting more types of therapeutic devices, therapeutic devices that they can access from their own home. So all of these things have really been contributing to why we're seeing more of these devices, why we're seeing more of these devices coming to the lab, either in the early stage or in the end stage for product testing. So you'll see a lot of different graphs, a lot of different information out there kind of predicting the size of this market. This is specifically one that I drew from Grandview Research looking at the U.S. home health care market, um, an increase in both equipment and services, as we mentioned, right, with this idea of aging populations and an increase in chronic illnesses. 
there's a need for home health care services, services either in the comfort of your own home, small group homes, but also all of the equipment that's required to support this space. You'll see a lot of different numbers. I mean, this one shows a 7.4% CAGR. Depending on what you look at, depending on you know, how broad the research is, a lot of people are looking into this market as a big, significant opportunity within the healthcare space. So the other thing that we're seeing a lot of that we maybe haven't seen in the past or, or seen even more of than we have previously is non-traditional medical device manufacturers wanting to get into this space, right? Everything with these growth drivers, everything with the COVID pandemic has really pushed this opportunity for non-medical manufacturers to enter the space and really cause some disruption. Um, it's opened the door for new market entrants. Um, we're seeing many, many tech companies. I mean, if you read the news, if you get on the news, you'll see every big tech company really trying to get into this space. Uh, many consumer electronics manufacturers getting into this space as well. And a lot of what they're looking at is, you know, how they can improve and create a better patient experience. Back to this idea of the consumer-driven healthcare, you see some of these, you know, tech-type companies or non-traditional medical device companies getting into this space as experts in the consumer space, as experts in consumer products, now wanting to get into the healthcare space and medical products, looking to develop cost-effective type products for home healthcare solutions, and really focusing on creating better health equity and better accessibility to healthcare for all. Uh, of course, you know, it is really challenging if you're a, a non-traditional medical device manufacturer or haven't been through the processes of, you know, what a medical device manufacturers deals with. So there's many challenges, right, with standards and regulatory hurdles. There's also competition that can exist. So it's important to, of course, if you're entering into this space, really take the time to understand the regulatory landscape and what's required. I think we'll continue to see a lot of investment in this space from these large tech companies. Um, we see you know, a lot of M&A happening, a lot of acquisition of healthcare companies. So as we see these trends moving forward with home healthcare devices and non-traditional medical device manufacturers get in this space, it'll be really interesting to see over the next you know, five, 10 years as technology is advancing, what types of products start developing in the AI and VR space, in the software as a medical device space, um, in everything digital health. So we'll see a lot more market entrance in that way. So some of the top products that we're seeing, as mentioned, right, we see a lot of products coming into the lab, either at an early stage for support with development or all the way through to failure analysis. So we see a lot of different types of devices. Uh, one of the common things that we're seeing is, of course, monitoring devices. Over the years, we've seen an incredible evolution in these devices to become smaller, much more compact, wireless in many cases, user-friendly, and really allowing patients to easily track different metrics of health and be able to report that back to their care provider um, and just incredible developments in the monitoring devices space. Another area that we're seeing a lot of devices is the rehabilitation space. So again, becoming more portable, certainly more user-friendly. And now we see them integrating with some of these digital health platforms that also allow for some level of monitoring and tracking from a remote aspect. Um, but we're seeing respiratory devices, you know, as mentioned, of course, everyone's aware of these aging populations and chronic illnesses things like sleep apnea and asthma being treated by these respiratory type devices and monitored in that way. Uh, we'll likely see many more of those. Infusion pumps, more compact, more user-friendly, really allowing patients to receive treatment from the care of their own home. And then this just incredible area of telehealth devices and digital health. You know, pre-pandemic, people would have thought it was crazy to think that you could have a remote consultation with a doctor that you could get, you know, have a, a meeting with your doctor via your iPad, right? And now it's just such a standard, such a common practice. People expect that their healthcare device is going to be as easy as, you know, turning on their iPhone and, and being connected. So many more advancements in the digital health and, and telehealth space with video conferencing and, and things like that. All right. So as with, you know, most medical devices, there's a lot of things to take into consideration when you're designing a home healthcare product. Of course, the first step is always the risk assessment process and conducting a thorough risk assessment, 
now when you think about a device that's going into a home, risk and risk assessment becomes even more important, right? And you know, understanding all of those risks that now exist because you're not having necessarily a, a trained or well-trained user using the device that there's additional risks that are introduced as well as risks of people using these devices either in their home or in their day-to-day -day life from an, you know, as they're walking through their lives. Additionally, understanding the standards that are required. Uh, there's additional standards that of course apply to devices that are for home use. So all of the typical standards that would apply to a medical device or to your specific type of medical device, but also adding the element of standards that apply for home healthcare devices specifically. With these devices, we see that you know, safety testing and EMC testing becomes even more essential and critical. Uh, with EMC, you have to consider that now you're taking these products into an environment where someone is you know, playing on an iPad, uh, someone is on their phone doing a FaceTime. There's, there's so much interference now that exists and EMC testing becomes even more critical. Uh, we also see along with that cybersecurity and cybersecurity risks that come into play, uh, not only from a device itself perspective, but also network security, right? There's a lot that goes into this now that you're taking a device either into a home or into an environment that's uncontrolled. Uh, we also see this idea of, you know, user-centered design, usability, thinking about now, you know, can, can grandma use this? Can a child use it? How big are the buttons? Is it easy for someone to receive the treatment that they need? Is it, is it user-friendly enough that someone would want to be using it and using it as it is prescribed to them? And then the documentation, labeling, marking, all of that becomes even more essential because now you wanna make sure that someone could easily pick up the device and understand um, the instructions for use, right? It's not an 100 page, 200 page you know, instructions for how to use a device because now it could be anyone in the comfort of their own home using these types of products. So in addition to the standards aspect of it and the design aspect, right, you have your risk management, all of the documentation that goes along with it, identification of the standards and testing. Of course, you have to consider all of the regulatory requirements for the global markets and where you're targeting with your products. Um, we've seen, you know, these types of devices over the years. Some, you know, home healthcare devices before could be considered consumer devices and now they're being treated as medical devices. So it's important to understand the regulatory markets that you're targeting, the agencies that you're targeting with those products uh, and making sure you're understanding all of the requirements that they have. So of course we have the FDA regulating products here in the US, we have the MDD and then in the future, the MDR, we have NMPA in China, right? So there's all of these regulatory agencies that are viewing and reviewing home health devices just as they would medical devices. And sometimes with even additional scrutiny or additional requirements than they have for some traditional type products. We also see other key markets where people are targeting with these types of devices, uh, Australia, Canada, Brazil, uh, lots of these global markets where people are looking to get these products into the hands of patients, each having their own kind of unique flavor of regulatory requirements um, following the medical device guidelines. And then as mentioned, right, in addition to just testing to the standard, there's performance standards and design considerations that they may be looking for. Um, and all the other things that go along with this submission for a pre-market submission. So before I turn it over to Mike and transfer into the standards specific part of the discussion, um, the, the base standard that we follow always from a testing side for uh, medical devices is the 60601 series of standards applying to all medical devices and then 60601-1-2 for EMC. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. We also have the 60601-1-11 standard, which is the relevant standard for home health care devices. So devices that are intended to be used in that home health environment and maybe you know, used by a user that does not have a level of professional training or experience that a healthcare professional would. So we introduced that standard and there's a lot to consider as part of that in the testing process. In addition to that, and then we'll get into some of the nuances from Mike, we see not only the general requirements of the standard and the EMC requirements, we also have to think even more about things like alarms. So the 60601-1-8 standard, if a device is being used in a home, it, you know, alarms become critical as well. 
if the user themselves need to be able to hear an alarm and make a judgment based on that, or if it goes to a caregiver or care provider in the home, we see that standard becoming even more important. And then the environmental requirements and performance requirements, which I'm excited for Mike to touch on and talk a little bit more about as we get into the second part of this presentation. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike leading right into some of those environmental issues and challenges that we see with home healthcare type devices. Thank you, Larissa. Yeah, yeah, I think the very first thing we should talk about is when you go into the home is that's different than being professionals. Now you have to deal with children, right? Children are in the home, they're playing, and they see somebody playing with this device and doing something and they think it's a toy. Why don't I go see what I can do to make it beep, especially if it has a lot of beep. So. You know, when we go in a home, we have children we have to deal with. We have a, a sanitation issue. So we also have like how clean is the home, um, et cetera, if the home is messy, but you also have a lot of dust, dirt, and type that could be tracked in. Uh, we have public emergencies. Um, you know, this, is, this became a big thing for home healthcare when Katrina happened. We watched all those people with air tanks trying to be dragged and figure out where they're going to plug their devices in because they need it. So public emergencies is also something we have to think about when we go into home. Uh, noise. And this is more of like how loud it's TVs, it's radios, it's the guy next door playing his guitar. All those kind of things have to be thought about when we go into the home, especially when we start talking about alarms and, and stuff like that. And also in noise is also how loud is your device um, from a noise perspective? Is it going to be something that's going to aggravate somebody? Um, you have pets we have to deal with. We have vermin potentially for storing of of devices, especially any kind of accessories to make sure that they're in a, kept in a good area and the packaging is right so that they don't go in and, and, and pretty much wreck this and then the people don't know and all of a sudden they're inhaling it. We have EMI, um, which we'll talk about a little later. So I'll just go through that. We have the location. The biggest thing with like locations is it's everywhere, right? The idea when, you, when we talk home healthcare, it's not just somebody's house it's going to the stadium it's fishing on a boat it's everything you can think about the whole idea with uh, most of this equipment going to the home is we want people to be able to go and do anything they want power sources how clean how good um do they have 14 things plugged into the power cords and now that's number 15 going to things so we have to think about that temperature and humidity it can be a big big deal because you know not everybody has air conditioning so when you started using things in a professional environment where it's basically 70 degrees all day long, now all of a sudden it goes in the home and it might be 100. Or they're using it outside in, in Arizona, Texas, where I'm at, it can be 120 degrees in the summertime. So, you know, we have to take all that into consideration. And then overall air quality, you know, smog, dust, maybe smoke, as I said, in a public emergency. To, to be thought about. And then for devices that need water, you know, water can be used as something that's going to be used to help clean, but it might be something that your device needs itself to actually operate. So if it's a device that needs water, how are we going to make sure that we condition that water to make sure that it's safe? And those are all items that have to be considered. All right, Clarissa. Next slide. Perfect. Then obviously we have user issues. Users might be even harder than what we just talked about, which you have a lifestyle. You know, if if the, if it's ugly and it's something they have to wear all the time, they might not wear it, right? So we have to kind of think about that. We have to think about if if you have a device like. Uh, and like a insulin pump, you know, those are going to be very, people want to be able to use them. They want to be able to go everywhere and walk around and not have to worry about it and take it everywhere with them. But if it's, if it doesn't fit right, doesn't fit their clothes right, they might not use it, which is, we think they would, but a lot of times the users won't. Uh, how easy is it to use? Again, we want to make sure it's very, very easy to use. So that way they're, they're, they're going to want to use it. Uh, we're seeing much more of the very much tablet, you know, smartphone type of screens being used because everybody has one or at least knows how to use them. So they, a lot of manufacturers we see going more home healthcare are having that same kind of thing. So it's easy to use. It could even be an app. We're seeing much more of the applications that are running home devices. So now a lot of people know how to use an app. Um, 
my four-year-old grandkid probably can run the apps better than most people, but they know how to get in the app and do whatever they want to do. So everything is pretty good. Um, availability of instructions. Uh, Clarissa touched on making sure it's not 200 pages long, but at the same time, where are those instructions and are they easy to get to? And we shouldn't just think about storing them up on the web because again, what if the web goes down? Um, what if somebody loses internet? What if the people going home don't even have the internet? Um, it seems kind of far-fetched for probably a lot of us on this call that people don't have the internet, but there's a lot of people that don't have the internet. So we have to think about that when we go ahead and go through um, how durable the product is. Going in a home, durability has to be a big thing. Um, my always favorite is uh, it was the insulin pump. My, my son's one of my son's best friends. They played hockey together ice hockey and he had to have an insulin pump so i'm sure when they made you know that insulin pump they probably were not thinking about a 220 pound kid checking somebody into the boards or being checked into the boards so we have to think about that durability and how we're going to use it um off label use making sure people are using it the way that it's supposed to they're not doing something wrong with it that's off label we just have to keep it in the back of our mind you know, once we go into the home, you never know what people are going to do. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, education level of the actual operators. You know, this also gets into the instructions for use where we have to have instructions for use that are good for like an eighth grade reading level. So we have to make sure we also talk, keep those instructions simplified. Um, you know, the more simplified the instructions are, the more likely that people are going to be able to use it. And out of everything we talk about here, I think some of these last two are maybe the most important is A, the emotional stability of the person that not just the patient, but maybe it's a, maybe it's a relative who's acting as the caregiver. You can have somebody who's a professional, knows everything there is, doctor, nurses, everything. But now all of a sudden things change because it's my mom, it's my, you know, my wife, my husband, my partner, everybody could be in it. Now all of a sudden, um, it kind of gets thrown out the window, all the experience that they know and all their training they may know, because now all of a sudden they're emotionally invested. And because of that, things can happen. You know, if somebody's in duress, you know, it could freak somebody out because everybody reacts differently under pressure. And we have to remember that. And then last but not least, we have to think about the physical capabilities. You know, as we age, as the, you know, as all the different countries get older and older, you know, Devices that I can use today, I might not be able to use tomorrow, right? Somebody may have a, a something with them that they're using this analysis, and maybe they the the dexterity that they had is no longer there. You know, maybe the buttons that they could see months ago, uh, you know, do the eyesight going down, they can't see as much. So all of those physical capabilities we do have to think about as we go in and we design these products. Next slide. So. What I'm showing you is some of the primary differences here. This is more of the standards based and we're, we're, it's really kind of the things that we see people, I uh, say struggle when they first go from a professional environment to a home healthcare environment. And we just wanted to bring these to light. So hopefully help everybody else pass easier. So the very first thing we that a lot of people struggle with is having to be a class two device, which just basically means that you have a you know, two prong plug with no earthing. Uh, you're also not allowed functional earthing. Uh, functional earthing is usually used from an EMC perspective. So that's why it's not allowed. You can do home health care if you are permanently installed. That also means you have to have an electrician come in. So it's a licensed electrician if they're installing it, uh, that's okay. So if somebody was setting something up and you know, the person can only use it in this situation, then that would be okay. Uh, there are some things, but we won't get in some, some part two standards do overwrite this a little bit. Um, but if you had that, it'd be something we probably want to talk about on a one-on-one. -on -one so everybody understands the other ramifications. Uh, and then all the apply pots have to be a type BF or CF, which means it's floating, which makes sense when you think that the, there's no earthing. So there's, it's not using earthing as protection. Next slide. Okay, so then the next thing we again we talked about a little bit more about you know a documentation markings identification have to be at that you know minimum of eight years of schooling. Um, 
you know, it should be simple to use, not required reference back to those 200 page documents that probably a lot of you have to make for your professional devices to actually be able to operate everything you need. So it's going to be something more simplified. Um, you know, simple to use, minimize. Hopefully it's something that if you're referencing, if you absolutely have to reference a guide, maybe it's a two or three pager where they can just go, oh, okay, that's what I got to do. Uh, so they can go ahead and work the device. So again, documentation and the usability of those documentation have to be much more simplified uh, for going into the home. The next slide. The other thing people struggle with is you go from professional to you know to home is ingress. Now we have to make sure that the unit passes water protection, and this is especially the devices that are I'll call them non-traditional that have always been in the hospital and now they're going home and maybe they never had to pass ingress protection against water, but now you go into the home and now you have to. So anything transportable, handheld, body worn has to be an IP22. And basically that's, I, it's almost like, I always call it 22, kind of like a rain test. Like it's, it's raining great. Whereas all the other transportable equipment is more of the IP21, which is kind of a gentle, misty kind of rain is the best way I describe it. Um, you are allowed to have a carry case to provide that additional protection. So if you had an IP20 device that you could never, that you would never be able to uh, get to pass, you are allowed to put a case, but you have to mark the case. And then you also get into some warnings to make sure everything's in the case at all times. Um, we see this less and less nowadays because most people don't want to rely on the case because we all know what's going to happen. Um, once you go into home, they're never going to use it. So why put a case out that you know they're not going to use? It's usually better if you can try to, to meet this. And a lot of this reason is we know the fact it goes home, liquids are going to be spilled on it. Someone's spilling their soda, whatever is going to be spilled on it. Um, and then the other thing that's in there when you go into home is the other openings in the enclosure. I tested using a small finger probe, which is smaller than the normal one, and that's to simulate children, because obviously if there's an opening, children are going to try to stick their finger in it. So we have to make sure we protect the little ones. All right, next slide. So uh, one of the other things we started to do is we need to make sure we protect the operators and, and others from being able to mess the controls up. So how do we do this? We want to make sure that changing a control is not just, I hit a quick button and, oh my gosh, I'm in some other mode that I don't know. Um, it doesn't cause any unexpected movement for things that are going into the home that are moving, which we're seeing more and more devices that have moving parts that are going into the home, which brings a whole nother aspect of safety. Um, Want to make sure all the connections are right. Connections are easy. Maybe not use a bunch of the same type of connectors so that it's easy for the person at home. It could be something that you block off connectors so they can't think they can use the USB and charge their phone, for instance, might be a good thing to do. If, if you have USB type adapters, maybe they're closed off when it goes home so people can't go into that. Um, then, you know, any kind of changing of things. And then the probably the other thing is, you know, making sure out of all of this that I see is also making sure that things, there's no small pots that could be inhaled or swallowed by either them or, again, we got to go back to children. We all know if it's on the ground, it's in their mouth at some point. So we have to make sure that we go ahead and, and get all that settled. So, and then last but not least, we have to really make sure we're going to have limited training. You know, this isn't going to be, you know, it's a lay person who doesn't understand everything about it. So they're not going to be, you know, a nurse or a doctor who's going to be able to go in there and intuitively kind of know how everything is going to work. So um, the other thing that brings into line is shock and vibration. Um, and, and this is basically, you know, pretty much what it says, shock vibration. Um, won't get into all the details. It all depends upon your product, what, what values you're going to have. But these are the standards. The only other thing to bring into here also is to remember there's another standard, the RTCA D0160. That has to do with shock and vibration if you're allowing things to go on aircraft, whether it's a helicopter, commercial jet, et cetera. So those should also be thought about depending upon what you're gonna do. And then the other thing in some of the construction is to make sure that the controls that you want. So if you're sending something home and you 
you're letting them change some things, but you don't want them to change everything. Maybe you want to make sure for, say, the insulin pump, you know, they could do like a quick bolus if they needed it because they're down, but you don't want to, you want to control how much that bolus is. And you would also want to control the dose they're getting all the time and you don't want them to change it. So some of the ways to make sure is you'd have to have some way in there of preventing that authorized change, unauthorized change. And that can be done with like a tool or it could be done with just a passcode. So there's a passcode that has to be entered, goes into the whole mode and they can't get back into it. So it keeps them safe and make sure nobody can mess with it and mess up what's going on with the treatment. Um, as we've been talking over and over again with strangulation and, and whatnot is, is routing of wire and tubing, you know, and, and it's making sure, you know, a lot of things come in here. We talked about noise, making sure something isn't noisy. I mean, I seen pictures of, um, of device that was being used at oxygen concentrator and it was literally being put in the closet because it was noisy and it had like 50 feet of tubing running through the house to be able to use it. So obviously huge, huge, uh, chance for lots of bad things to happen. You can have strangulations, you could have pet hair get in, there's all kinds of problems at that point. So that is another thing that has to be in there. Uh, retention devices, so these cables go back to where they would be. Um, and then optional lengths of accessories, you know, some of the ECG style equipment we're coming up that has a million cables because that's how they work. Uh, making sure maybe they have a couple different ones. So if they're sitting down, it's this. Maybe they have a sleeping one that's a little shorter. So at night, they don't have to worry about strangling themselves. CPAPs and the like that have hose and stuff, we want to make sure we take special care to make sure that strangulation hazard is not likely. And then last, kind of a lot, but at least, but we're going to talk about some EMC. Uh, and one of the things here is the EMC requirements from going from a professional environment to a home environment are greater. So class B, it comes out to about three times as hard. So the levels are three times lower than they are for professional environments. And so that has to be taken into consideration. And also when we talked about RTCA DO160 earlier, talking about shock and vibration, there's also, if you're going on a helicopter, aircraft, whatnot, there's actually EMC requirements that are much more stringent from not just an emissions perspective, but even more so from an immunity perspective. So those all have to be taken into account when you go into home, where you're gonna use it and how you're gonna use it. And it's gonna be, you know, we have to make sure that we fix the device, uh, especially for the emissions, because, you know, lots of studies have been shown that if you, if you're messing up somebody's TV program or radio program while they use the device, they may not use the device. So we want to make sure we keep that into consideration uh, as we go through and make sure those levels are down. On top of that, when we start talking about devices and your devices, we're also seeing more and more times where it's not a medical device being brought into the home. It's multiple medical devices being brought into the home. So we have to make sure that when you design your device that you're not interfering potentially with another medical device that's being brought into the home. So there's a lot more from an EMC perspective when you go into the home that we have to think about. Perfect, I think that about, about wraps up the slide deck, right Mike? Yes, it does. Yeah, perfect. So Nicole, we'll turn it back over to you. If there's any questions, we're happy to answer them. Or of course, our contact information is available if it's easier to contact directly and have one-on-ones. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. Obviously, a lot to consider. <laughs> we do have a couple questions that came in uh, through the Q&A function that um, we have some time left, so I can go through them. Folks who are still um, on the webinar, please feel free if you have specific questions to put them in the Q&A function and we'll be happy to ask them. Okay, the first one that I have, um, talk about what's the definition of home? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Everything not in a professional environment would be the best way to describe home. So if it, you know, professional environment's a little different in the US versus for instance, Europe. In the U.S., we do consider senior citizens' homes um, professional environments, but when you go to Europe, they do not consider that a professional environment. So that also has to be taken into account that as you go from country to country, home will change. Uh, it'd be great if I could say, this is the answer for everything, um, but 
there really isn't. In the United States, it's the minute you leave a professional environment, um, it's considered home health care. Yeah, and I think sometimes people forget about the application of the standards when devices are being used um, in all of these different types of environments because they're like, well, it's not a home, but as soon as it you know leaves that professional care environment or isn't being, even if it's being used by a professional person, it, it may mm -hmm. still need or require the dash one dash 11 testing as part of the evaluation. Okay, great. Um, another question we have is, what are considerations for ambulatory equipment or home healthcare devices that are portable? So, so those devices are all, all covered quite extensively within the 111. They are there. When we started talking about like the shock and vibration, as well as the ingress protection, uh, they go up when you start talking about anything ambulatory and home healthcare. Um, it is controlled. That's like the minimum. I always say like the standards in general standards are the minimum you have to meet, but it's up to the manufacturer in the end to understand where they're going to use it again. Uh, we have a device that we just recently tested that again, another, a different insulin pump. And they're literally, their claim is that you can go swimming, right? <laughs> up to 10 meters. So when we did our testing, we had to test a unit at, down at basically three meters to make sure that everything they were claiming was actually correct and that it stayed sealed, there's no water gun in it. So the requirements within 111 and all this are just a bare minimum that you have to meet. And it's really up to the manufacturer in the end to decide how am I using this and how do, my, how do I want my people to use it? Uh, we see a lot of medical devices that are ambulatory. They don't use IP2, they use IP4, which is like a sideways hard rain. Uh, because they know the whole idea is they want people to go out and do things with it. Mm -hmm. And I think too, you make such a good point, Mike, right? About, you know, the considerations with your risk assessment and your risk management, right? And really understanding how people are using your device, what your intended use is, and that there may be additional requirements above and beyond just the standards because of what your intended use is for the devices. And then even further, right? What the regulatory agencies are asking to see in terms of additional performance testing or durability testing to show that you could withstand certain environmental conditions. All right. Um, and Mike, you talked a little bit about, you know, insulin pumps. What about other types of wearables? Are there additional considerations for that type of device? It'd be pretty much the same kind of considerations. We're seeing a, a lot of different halt monitors as a one that we see a lot of um, that that are worn basically for 24 hours and they, they pretty much measure your heart during that time frame. And part of that whole thing came out of is a lot of time, obviously, when people do go to a doctor or they do go to the hospital, people's heart rates tend to elevate naturally, right? People's blood pressures come up more because they're nervous going into the going into the hospital, going to the doctors, whereas at home they start relaxing, which is a, some of the reason we're seeing more and more tele telehealth and the like coming up because you know people are just more relaxed at your house than you are when you're in when you're in a hospital setting you know your, your blood pressure definitely can go up depending upon why especially why you're there if you're there and you think it's something to do with maybe heart issues uh, the minute you walk through that door you're already kind of anxious you're already there but any kind of device being worn at home and we're seeing more and more of those like I, I almost call them tweener devices where they cross, are they truly a medical device or are they some of the wearables that we're seeing where it's that they're kind of blurring the lines between commercially as well as medical. And those are the toughest ones for us to, to do because in the US or Europe, we could consider it one thing. And in other countries, we consider it another like uh, blood glucose for people with to, to measure your uh, insulin and stuff. You know, in, in the U.S. and whatnot, we don't consider those medical devices, but a lot of the Asia, a APAC countries, they do consider that a medical device. So those are the type of devices that do get kind of tricky when you start talking about going into the home. Yeah, and I think wearables, too, will be really interesting to watch because as they're getting more advanced and they're able to either provide, you know, more intensive measurements or provide more predictability or provide more data back to doctors. And then they really are being used in a prescriptive way or in a way that to make some sort of diagnosis, it, it could likely change, right? What regulations that we're seeing because these are just becoming so much more advanced and so much more part of, of people's day-to-day -day lives. And to your point, Mike, I mean, now you can collect 
you know, a large amount of data versus your blood pressure at one individual moment sitting in a doctor's office. Now we can measure your heart rate and your oxygen concentration, all these things while you're just living your day-to-day -day life in a relaxed sense. Fantastic, provides a ton of opportunities. Um, we do have another question that came in. Um, what are important considerations for biocompatibility of wearable fabrics? That's I'm a great not, question. That's a great question. Uh, wow, biocompatibility. I'm not a biocompatibility expert, but I will say that uh, the, um, I mean, you have to take those considerations even more so in the home because now we have, I mean, let's get who it was it Fitbit a few years back, whereas, uh, you know, they had problems with their watch bands and people were breaking out because of, of the materials that were being used. They had to have a whole bunch of people get to send in a Fitbit and get a brand new Fitbit for their watches. Um, so those type of devices we have to think about because now, again, if we go home, we're talking wearables, especially, right? This is something that somebody's wearing constantly. So we have to watch those materials. And when you start looking at biocompatibility, it, it probably even even higher than it was when we talked about things that could be in a, in a hospital setting that you're going to use maybe for, you know, a half an hour and they might throw it away when it's done. But now it's something that's going to be used and it could be used for years. So it's not just the biocompatibility and how do we clean it today? But how do we keep it clean for again for the hopefully for the next five years if it's somebody that's that's doing that or on a yearly basis how do we keep that clean how do we make sure it stays clean disinfected and the others and and that's where when you start talking about that especially clean disinfection what I didn't bring up but you have to be very careful and be very descriptive of what you use because you know you don't want for a lot of products you don't want them taking a bunch of bleach in the back and pouring all over your device and next thing you know it doesn't work. Yeah, and I think too on the biocompatibility side, right? You know, traditionally we've had the ISO 10993 standard and we see people following that standard, but now we've started to see, you know, other ways to show compliance with biocompatibility requirements, additional biocompatibility studies and evaluations that people are doing. We've also seen a huge increase in like toxicology assessments and leachables and extractables and looking at the materials that are being used because you have these types of devices and components that are coming in contact with the patient for longer than maybe they used to be. So there's been a lot of movement in that space. And I think we'll see maybe even some movement away from the standard and into more um, specific test methods and specific test protocols and studies based upon the use of the device, because it really is difficult to use just that single standard to take all of the risks into consideration. So It'll be, I think, an interesting space over the next few years to see what they come up with, um, especially since we're seeing, you know, different regulatory agencies asking for additional information, additional studies, uh, additional data on, on the biocompatibility aspects with these types of devices. All right. Well, wonderful conversation today. Thank you so much again for your time, um, Mike and Carissa. That's all the questions we have in the queue right now. Do you guys have any closing comments you'd like to make? We do have uh, just a few more minutes available. Yeah, I mean, just from our side, thank you so much for having us. This was a great discussion. I mean, it's definitely an area that we're really excited about. I mean, medical technology in general is just in such an exciting time coming out of the pandemic and just seeing all of the R&D advancements that we're seeing and everything that we're seeing from a technology aspect and home health care is just Kind of one area of that realm, but really appreciate MassMedic and you guys having us here. It's always really fun to have these conversations. And of course, anyone can contact us at any time if they have additional questions or more specifics that they want to talk about, because these are our favorite topics and we love, we love chatting about medical devices. Wonderful. Well, obviously tons of expertise at Intertech. So thank you again, uh, Clarissa. Thank you, Mike, for uh, sharing today. And thank you, Intertech, for sponsoring this webinar and bringing this great content to our members. Um, this webinar will be shared with those who were not able to attend live, um, as well as the slides. And we encourage you to go to massmedic.com and look at all the other upcoming events we have. Um, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Right.